Chapter 2. Raids. The raid is a surprise attack designed to seize a point, exploit success, and then withdraw. It is a temporary measure to capture equipment, destroy installations, bait traps to draw out enemy reactions, and attack morale. The Mujahideen conducted raids as a primary way to obtain weapons and ammunition, preferably from DRA security posts. They also conducted raids to demonstrate their ability to attack DRA and Soviet installations with relative impunity. Raids generally require fewer supplies than an attack on a strong point, since there is no intention of holding the objective for any length of time following a raid. Vignette 1. Raid on the Totum Dara security post by Commander Sashar. The Soviets had a series of security posts protecting the Salong Kabul Highway. They had one at Totum Dara, which is 8 kilometers north of Sharakar, map 2-1, Totem Dara. This post had five armored vehicles. We mounted a raid on the security post in September 1981. My base was in Gorbin Canyon. I had 60 Mujahideen armed with four Guryanov heavy machine guns, two PK medium machine guns, four RPG-7s, and Kalashnikov rifles. The area around my base is very mountainous but also heavily patrolled, so we had to move at night. We moved from our base over the mountain pass to our staging area at Ofion e Sharif. Ofion e Sharif is about three kilometers south of our target, and it took us six hours to reach it from Gorbond. We had to carry all our equipment on our backs. We stayed in Afiani Sharif during the day and rested and made our plan. That night, we crossed over to the east into the green zone and moved into the villages near the target. I positioned 40 of my Mujahideen to secure our route back into the mountains and to help carry the gear. The other 20 were my raiding party. I divided these 20 men into a 10-man group for immediate security and a 10-man assault group. The assault group had two Goryanov heavy machine guns, two pick PK medium machine guns, two RPG-7s, and some Kalashnikovs. We attacked the post that same night. We destroyed two tanks with RPGs and terrified their infantry with our Goryanovs. However, the security post was heavily protected by mines, so we could not cross the minefields to get into the post. The Soviet security post at Puli Matak and the project security post, named after the Chinese irrigation project, were on the Totem Dara security post flanks. Both of these posts opened fire on us, and we were forced to withdraw. We withdrew to our base in Gorbind by the same route we came. We had no casualties. Commentary The Soviets employed millions of mines in Afghanistan for installation security, LOC security, and area denial. Mine clearing was a major problem for any Mujahideen attack on a prepared site and often prevented Mujahideen at success. The Mujahideen needed rugged, lightweight mine detection and clearing gear, which would allow them to clear mines quickly under fire. Often the Mujahideen had to resort to heavy, large rocks to create a path through a minefield. Attacking parked vehicles is certainly easier than attacking vehicles which are crude and moving. Apparently, the Soviets had not bothered to create a sandbag wall around their tanks, although an RPG can penetrate the turret armor of older tanks. The Mujahideen chose a target flanked by two other outposts that could bring fire onto their attacking flanks. The flank security elements were close-in elements that merely guarded the flanks and did nothing to pin the outposts in position. The bridge outpost should have been an easier target with a better chance of success. This attack could have employed a larger force in two phases. The first phase would be an attack to the flanks to neutralize the flanking fire. The second phase would then be an attack on the Totem Dura post. Such an attack would require better coordination and discipline than demonstrated. Vignette 2, Shamtala Raid, by Saranawal, attorney, Sher Habib. In June 1982, Commander Shiragi led a group of 10 of my Mujahideen on a successful raid on a DRA outpost on the Shamtala Plain near Highway 2, just north of Kabul. 
Commander Shiragai was a Kochi and a kinsman of the Kochi clan, which had its summer quarters in Pagam and in the areas around Kabul. Some of the families of the clan pitched their tents in Chamtala Plain. There, they tended their flocks of sheep and goats in the grazing lands just north of Kabul. Their grazing lands were close to a DRA security outpost. The DRA outpost hindered Mujahideen movement through the area. Map 2-2, Chamtala. We decided to raid the DRA outpost. I selected Commander Shiragai to lead the raid since he could easily gain the full cooperation of his Kochi clansmen in the area. His group was armed with small arms. They left their base at Kala-e-Hakim in Pagam and walked to the Chumtala Plain. There, Kochi families took the raiding party into their tents and cared for them. The raiding party stayed with the nomads for several days while they studied and evaluated the outpost and prepared for the raid. Commander Sheragai wanted to find an unmined approach to the outpost, so he asked his kinsmen to move their flocks to various spots around the outpost so he could probe the approaches. This went on for three days while Commander Shiragai picked the most secure approach to the outpost where the terrain allowed the Mujahideen to sneak up on the outpost unobserved. They cleared this approach of mines. On the morning of the raid, Mujahideen raiders moved to the target with a herd of sheep. Some Mujahideen posed as shepherds while others crawled along in the middle of the grazing sheep. The herd moved right up to the DRA outpost but the Mujahideen presence was never detected or suspected by the DRA guards. The raiding group spent the whole day in the middle of the sheep herd and found hiding places. At sunset, the shepherds drove the flock back toward the encampment while the Mujahideen remained behind in hiding places. One of the things that the Mujahideen had discovered was when the seven-man security outpost had dinner. One guard was left on duty while the rest ate their dinner. As dinner was being served, three Mujahideen crept to the outpost, jumped the guard, and disarmed him. One Mujahideen kept his hand on the mouth of the guard to prevent him from screaming. Then the rest of the raiding party swarmed into the outpost. They surprised the rest of the DRA soldiers and captured them all without firing a shot. A DRA lieutenant was among the prisoners. The Mujahideen took whatever they could carry and then left for their base with all their prisoners. Commentary Kabul and the surrounding area were heavily guarded. The Soviet 103rd Airborne Division, the 180th and 181st Motorized Rifle Regiments of the Soviet 108th Motorized Rifle Division, the DRA 8th Infantry Division, the DRA 37th Commando Brigade, and the DRA 15th Tank Brigade were all garrisoned in Kabul. Careful reconnaissance, strict camouflage discipline, and a clever deception plan enabled the Mujahideen to carry off this raid. Local assistance from the Kochi was essential to the plan. The selection of a Kochi commander and his efforts to gain the cooperation of his kinsmen paid off. The Mujahideen relied on the local populace for cover, food and water, intelligence, shelter, and early warning. The time and effort spent were essential to the Mujahideen's success. On the other hand, the DRA commander allowed his outpost activities to become routine. The Mujahideen planned the attack when security was relaxed and captured the outpost without firing a shot or alerting neighboring garrisons. Vignette 3 Raid on Bagrami District Headquarters by Commander Shahabuddin In July 1983, local units of all seven major factions united to raid the Bagrami District Headquarters of the southeast of Kabul. No map. We assembled about 250 Mujahideen armed with six 82mm mortars, nine recoilless rifles, and eight RPG-7s. We assembled at my base at Yakdara, made our plans, and then spread our forces out into the village. We assigned 100 Mujahideen to route security and posted them prior to moving our main raiding forces to Bagrami and Kali Ahmad Khan. These towns are in the suburbs just outside of Kabul and are part of the inner security belt of Kabul. The Bagrami 40-man assault group had eight RPG-7s, three recoilless rifles, and two mortars. They were to attack the district headquarters from three directions. I led the assault group at Kali Ahmad Khan. It had 50 men, 10 of which I used for flank protection, and 40 for the raid. I also attacked from three directions. As we approached Kali Akhmadan, 
We were stopped by a small outpost. We overran it. Then we attacked one of the many security outposts in the village. We overran this outpost, killing 25 and capturing 8 DRA soldiers. We also captured 14 Kalishnikovs and a telephone set. The Bagrami assault group could not get close enough to their target to attack it directly, so they shelled it instead. Commentary The DRA and Soviets surrounded Kabul with a series of three security belts composed of outposts, minefields, and obstacles. Their purpose was to deny Mujahideen entry into the city and prevent Mujahideen shelling attacks. The Mujahideen often attacked these outposts, but could not hold them. The main benefits of the security belt system to the Mujahideen were these attacks kept a large number of troops tied up in passive security roles. The outposts provided a source of weapons and ammunition, and these attacks affected the morale of their opponents. Vignette 4. Attack on the Swaki Security Post by Lt. Col. Haji Mohammed Rahim. Saki is a district of Kunar province. The DRA established a security post in the Saki High School. This high school security post provided protection for a section of the Jalalabad to Asadabad Highway. Map 2-3, Saki. It was a usual practice of the DRA to convert public buildings to such uses. I decided to capture this post in October 1983. I had approximately 70 Mujahideen armed with two 82mm mortars, one DSHK, and some Enfield rifles. We planned our battle in our base in the nearby Babur Gorge. Other Mujahideen joined us from Dawagal. We would attack from three directions, from the north, high ground, along the road from the northeast, and from the west. We moved from our base at night, deployed, and attacked the target. Our attack lasted 30 minutes. We overran the post, but could not hold it. We killed 11 DRA and captured one. We also captured a ZGU-1, a Dishka, and some Kalishnikovs. We had three Mujahideen, KIA, and one WIA. We could not hold the security post, so we left it. There were two DRA security outposts near the Saki district headquarters. One was in the high school, and the other was near the bridge. We had a contact inside the second post, who was a DRA officer, Musa Khan. In June 1985, he helped us capture his security post. I assembled 50 Mujahideen armed with an RPG-7, Kalishnikovs, and Enfields. We came during the night from our base in Babur Valley and followed the road back to the southwest. We approached the post at dawn from the high ground on the north. Our contact led us inside. Most of the soldiers were asleep and we wanted to capture them. However, some of our Mujahideen were not very quiet, and the detail woke up and started fighting us. We killed seven of the security detail and captured one. We also captured one PK medium machine gun, 12 Kalishnikovs, and ammunition. The firing alerted the other enemy unit in the Saki High School. They sent a detachment to the outpost, but I had posted a security element on the road. The security element blocked the movement of the detachment and covered our withdrawal. We all withdrew up to our base in the mountains. I had one Mujahideen wounded. Commentary Less than 15% of the Mujahideen commanders had previous military experience. Yet the impact of the military who joined the Mujahideen was significant. They provided a continuity, an understanding of military planning and issues, a modicum of uniform training, and an ability to deal with outside agencies providing aid to the Mujahideen. On the other hand, these were fairly soft targets. The security outposts were situated in existing buildings backed by wooded high ground. The Mujahideen had concealed approaches and exits as well as inside help. Vignette 5. Raid on Pul-e Sharki Radio Transmitter Station by Major Sher Aka Koche and others. In June 1984, provincial NIFA leader Wali Khan issued orders to Major Sher Aka Koche, the commander of an NIFA base in Siwak, about 20 kilometers southeast of Kabul. Major Aka would join two other regional commanders, Haji Hussein John of Nari Oba and Syed Hassan Khan of Kaki Jabbar in a raid on a radio transmitter station. The transmitter was located near pul e Sharki, 20 kilometers east of Kabul city, and the raid would take place on the night of 26 June. 
The Soviet-backed Afghan government was expanding the transmitter facility, which would reach wider audiences inside and outside the country. The station used local broadcasts as well as programs produced in the Soviet Union. The transmitter station was located in Pul e Charki, near a military complex which included the DRA 15th Tank Brigade, DRA 10th Field Engineer Regiment, and some other units. See Map 16A, Kufas 1, Chapter 1, and Map 2-4, Pul e Sharki. Further to the east, between Butak and Sarobi, a government-paid militia force controlled the area and protected the power lines and pylons that supplied electricity from Naglo Dam through Sarobi to Kabul. The militia was recruited from the local tribe of the Karokal clan of Amdazi Pashtuns. Their chief was Hassan Khan Karokal. On the surface, Hassan Khan was a government supporter, but he was actually a major Mujahideen collaborator. He provided the Mujahideen with logistic support, sheltered their resistance fighters, and even provided medical care to Mujahideen wounded at regime medical institutions. Principally based on an interview with Major Sher Aka Koche in Peshawar on September 14, 1996. Other sources include NIFA documents about the battle, Ali Jalali's discussions with Hassan Khan Karokal in 1986 in Peshawar, this interviews with the late Wali Khan Karokal, NIFA's provincial military commander of Kabul in Peshawar, and Islamabad in 1984-1986, and interviews with General Abdul Rahim Wardak, Map Sheet 2886, VIC Grid 3221. According to the plan, Mujahideen from the three bases would assemble at Mullah Omar for final instructions prior to the raid. By the afternoon of 26 June, all three groups were in Mullah Omar. Major Sher Aka and Haji Hussein John had each brought 30 men from their base in Siwak and Nari Oba. Syed Hassan Khan came with a 50-man unit from Kaki Jabbar. Wali Khan Karokel issued the final instructions. Major Sher Aka was appointed the overall commander of the raiding group. He divided his forces into four teams. A 20-man assault team, commanded by Haji Hussein John, carried automatic rifles, light machine guns, and RPG-7 anti-tank grenade launchers. Their mission was to attack the transmitter from the southwest, destroy the facility, and then withdraw under the cover of the support group. Major Sher Aka's 20-man support team would cover the assault team from positions in a ditch immediately to the east of the target. The group had one 82mm mortar, a single-barrel 107mm rocket launcher, BM-1, a PK medium machine gun, a few RPG-7s and AK-47 assault rifles. Major Sher Aka decided to stay with his team since it would be the last to pull out. Syed Hassan Khan commanded a 25 to 30 man containment team. They were armed with small arms and RPG 7s. They would block the Pul e Charki Butak Road on the east bank of Kabul River and prevent the enemy forces from reaching the target. The rest of the Mujahideen were assigned as supply and evacuation elements to help the other groups. Major Aka decided to launch the assault at midnight. Since it is about 15 kilometers from Mullah Omar to the site, and since the raiding party had to bypass the Soviet Union deployed in Gazakh, the departure time was set at dusk, about 20 hundred hours. The party would move from Mullah Omar through Gazakh to reassemble briefly at Lawano Kandao. The Mujahideen force moved out in small groups following each other on the same route all the way to Lawano Kandao. A pair of reconnaissance patrols moved on the flanks and one moved to the front of the column, keeping within voice contact distance. When the force reached a water spring at the Lowano Kandao, Major Sher Aka issued the last coordinating instructions and ordered the groups to open fire when he did. This would signal the start of the raid. From their Lowano Kandao assembly area, the different elements of the raiding party moved separately toward their designated areas. Just before midnight, all groups were in place. Everything was quiet around the transmitter site. At Major Sher Aka's signal, the assault team opened fire on the site and began the attack. The support team covered their advance. 
RPG rounds set the wooden buildings on fire and soon fire swept the site. The defenders at the site panicked and failed to put up an organized resistance. The assault team overran the site, killed several soldiers, captured five Kalashnikov assault rifles, and demolished the transmitter station. The DRA quickly responded by moving a tank column to the Puli Sharki garrison to the site. The column crossed the bridge over the Kabul River but then left the main road and bypassed the Mujahideen, blocking positions established by the containment holding team of Syed Hassan Khan. The tanks, driving with their headlights off, cut across the plain to the east of the Mujahideen, cutting off their escape route. A young Mujahideen named Babarak hit one tank with an RPG-7 rocket and set it on fire, but the rest of the column moved swiftly to the southwest. Fearing encirclement, the containment holding team and the assault team immediately broke contact and, without notifying Major Sheraka, pulled out toward the Lowenau Kandau, leaving the support team behind. As Commander Sheraka was desperately trying to establish contact with the other teams, he heard tanks moving to the rear of his position. By this time, all electric lights in the area were extinguished, but the transmitter station continued to burn brightly. The Mujahideen and the DRA tank column both used the fire for orientation. Facing a threatening situation, Major Sherika instructed his man not to panic, but to exfiltrate individually through the intervals between the tanks. Using masking terrain, his Mujahideen managed to exfiltrate and move to the designated assembly area at Lowen El Kandau. As they straggled in, they found that the assault and containment teams, along with the supply and evacuation personnel, were already waiting there. Major Sher Aka discovered that all the groups, except his support group, had withdrawn when the enemy tank column arrived. All Mujahideen reached Lowen El Kandau by 0200 hours. Mujahideen casualties were six wounded, one from the supporting team who died on the way back, two from the assault team, and three from the containment team. It was not safe for the Mujahideen to move further since daybreak would be in two hours and the Mujahideen would once again have to bypass the Soviet force at Grazok. The raid on Poli Sharki would clearly have alerted the Soviets to the presence of a Mujahideen force in their area. Two groups, Haji Hussein John's detachment and Syed Hassan Khan's party, decided to stay during the day in the Lowen El Kandau Mountains since they could not reach their bases during the remaining hours of the night. Major Sher Aka's group, along with the wounded, moved forward to Mullah Omar. This was only possible since Hassan Khan Karakal had sent trucks to Lowen El Kandau to carry the wounded and other Mujahideen to safety before daybreak. The trucks, posing as militia patrols trying to hunt down the raiding force, took the Mujahideen to Mullah Omar, where they were taken care of and medical personnel were summoned from Kabul who tended to the wounded. The next night, the Mujahideen groups returned to their bases and sent the body of one dead warrior to his family for burial. Commentary The assistance ex extended by the Karakal militia contributed markedly to the Mujahideen's success. Such assistance was essential for actions conducted around a strongly defended city like Kabul. From 1980 to 1984, the militia helped many Mujahideen infiltrate into Kabul before defecting en masse to the resistance. Their assistance was particularly important in supporting the withdrawal of Mujahideen strike groups at the end of an action. Such inside help made it possible for a force of more than 100 to launch a raid right in the heart of the enemy stronghold. Ideally, a much smaller group, like a 15-man team, would have been more appropriate to the task but the Mujahideen preferred to move in large groups. Large groups could carry heavy loads, provide needed labor in the field, and carry an escort the wounded and dead. Many Mujahideen felt more comfortable having their relatives or close friends with them. Lack of reliable internal communications among the Mujahideen combat teams led to a situation that could have turned disastrous. The containment team did not contain the DRA tanks and pulled out immediately after it saw the tanks bypass its position. The group helped the assault team during the assault, but this was not their assigned mission. Had the group laid anti-tank mines in areas that the enemy tanks had to pass over, particularly in the vicinity of the bridge over the Kabul River and the river fords, it could have delayed the tank column and allowed them to engage it more effectively. This would have prevented the enveloping movement and 
almost encircle the whole Mujahideen contingent. Apparently, the DRA had not developed and rehearsed contingency plans to deal with such a raid. This and luck helped the Mujahideen escape heavy casualties. A more active reaction by the DRA could have easily jeopardized the concentration of a sizable Mujahideen force in an area totally controlled by Soviet DRA forces. Relying on tanks, the enemy failed to deploy infantry with the tanks. Infantry are more effective in the dark against guerrillas and provide protection to the tanks against anti-tank gunners. At the same time, the Mujahideen failed to take advantage of the tank column's vulnerability and use their RPG-7s at close distance against the unprotected tanks. The Mujahideen had the opportunity to kill more than one tank they actually destroyed. Fear of being cut off inhibited much of the Mujahideen action after they successfully destroyed the transmitter. However, through good leadership, Major Sherika turned a threatening tactical situation into a more manageable one and succeeded in pulling his men out through the tank cordon.